Welcome to Soaps.com. I'm Kristen Burt. You know this person from General Hospital, Ryan's Hope, One Life to Live. Please welcome Eileen Kristen. Eileen, how are you today? I'm doing okay. You know, we're in the middle of a strike, so it's kind of um, sad in a way, you know. Well, let's get to it because I, there's so many Ryan's Hope fans, and to see the continuation of Delia from back then through the modern times, I love this. It's great. I wish they were using it more to the advantage that they should, but uh, they toss my name around quite a lot. She's always like mixed up in the action, but she's doing it from off screen. Yes, I mean, I know, which is which is kind of a shame, but uh, I, that may change. And I think it's you know, it's I think it's something is going to come up. Um, I'm not exactly sure when. Uh, I was surprised. Uh, Frank had contacted me. Frank Valentini had contacted me in May. Unfortunately, he contacted me on May 1st and on May 2nd, there was a strike. And um, in the all the confusion that goes along with that about who's going to be writing the show, uh, he because he said, you know, we'd, we'd like you to come and, and do this phone call. And uh, then I never heard back from him. And um, I understand because it just it, everything got really crazy. Uh, but I was disappointed. I didn't see the show, but I, I must have had 30 people call me to tell me that Delia was getting kidnapped. You're like, where people. is Delia while she's getting kidnapped? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was a little distressed about that because I, I felt um, if I wasn't going to be there, I felt it would have been nice just to know that that was going to happen. And if they needed me to do any publicity for that off-camera kidnapping, I would, you know, help them out and do whatever. Is the potential for Delia to come back on screen there for sure? I think so. Okay. I, I think so. I spoke to him the other day. Uh, I'm hopeful, you know, he, he seemed pretty clear that when the writers come back, uh, I may come back for a bit. Um, you know, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I, I felt pretty clear that when there's, when it's the right time. I mean, I felt like they missed this giant opportunity with, you know, with what was, whatever was going on. And as I said, I don't really watch it. I just had, I had so many people call me and I did a, a I did a singing gig out in Brooklyn in Marine Park and um, you know people just rush me because they love Delia they love Roxy they they want to see me back on the air so um, and it's hard because I don't know I, I really don't know what to tell them most of the time right because you don't have the power to say like oh I'm just going to go right back but are you open to short term or long term if they wanted you well, I'm open to anything that they could present uh I love living in New York and living out in LA well my sister has a um she has the Eileen room that she built in her garage uh my sister redid her garage and it's um her husband is a musician so he has this studio and then there's the Eileen room so <laughs> I I definitely have a place to stay it would not be difficult for me at all uh, to be out there. Um, and I think it would add something. I don't think they have that kind of colorful character on there. I don't know. Cause I, I haven't seen it in a long time. I, I think Delia always adds a lot of color. Oh, absolutely. We were joking that like, you need to open like a branch of like Ryan's bar across from, you know what I mean? Like right there in general hospital, wouldn't that be fantastic? I, I think it would be a great idea, you know, <laughs> from your mouth to uh, their ears. We'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm totally open. It's, it's not my call. If it was my call, I, I prefer acting to not acting. I mean, I'm doing a lot of theater work here. Right. So it's not like I'm bored because uh, I'm really not, uh, you know, between picketing and doing various readings and going to yoga every day. You know, I got plenty to do. I have a wonderful, wonderful partner, uh, Gary Donatelli, who used to direct One Life to Live. Mm -hmm. So I'm certainly not bored because he's the most interesting person I know. I love that. Well, yeah. and I think that's what it is. It's like you're busy and, and you've got a full life, but 
fans would love to see Delia back on the screen regularly. And I think yeah, that's what know, it I comes would, down to. I would prefer to be doing that than not doing it. Let me put of it that way. Um, if we if we go back though, like to Ryan's Hope, you know, which is such a classic, and people just hold that soap near and dear to their heart. Um, did you realize when you first started playing her, like what a unique character she was? You know, well, first let me say that I had dinner last night with Kate Mulgrew. No. Yes. Tell us. Tell us. I want to hear what the, this is a reunion. Kate and I ran into, you know, we we live basically in the same neighborhood, give or take, you know, 30 blocks, not even 20 blocks. Um, but usually, you know, Kate is traveling a lot. Uh, and we ran into each other last week and, and we looked at each other and we went, you know, we've known each other almost 50 years. So we have to sit down and we have to talk. And so we did last night and we had a fantastic dinner. And, you know, I have a high regard of respect for her. Um, when I started doing Ryan's Hope, uh, it was very scary. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. I, I, I had been used to doing theater. I had done Grease on Broadway. So I was used to doing something in the public eye, but not with a different script every day. Right. And, and the next thing I know, I'm thrown into the situation where not only do I have copious lines to learn, but I got to cry while I'm saying them. <laughs> and being a very kind of bubbly person who doesn't cry a lot, it was hard. It was, it was fascinating because I was fascinated in the character. Claire Levine, you know, at first when my agent um, told me about this, I wasn't, I said, well, I don't, I'm more of a comedian, so I don't really want to do so. And he said, well, I think that you'll find this character interesting. And he got me the, what they call the Bible and the character breakdown. And there must've been six pages about Delia as there were about all these characters. And I got intrigued. I got really intrigued. And I felt like this was my part because I was a native New Yorker. And, and there were just things about the character that I felt visually I, I said, I see her, I really, I see her, she's a waif and she's a child woman and she's this and she's that. And, and I, I just saw it and I got it. It's incredible too, because she had so many layers to her. You know, it's just that the anxiety, but at the same time, she has that comic relief. She has, you know, she is so many things all at once. And I think that being able to play that probably was fascinating for you as an actress because was, you didn't know what was, she was delivering. It was fascinating. And what was very interesting about it um, was I knew Nancy Addison who played Jillian from just around, you know, I knew her, her brother lived in my parents' building. So I knew her and I had known Malcolm Broom who was playing Patrick because we did Grease together. And then Katie, on the first day that I met Katie, and I was so impressed. I mean, she came in, she didn't even use her script. She just is rattling off these lines. And I'm like on my script because I'm playing a character that's so different from me that I had to like grab onto this. And also because my character was so going in the opposite direction in traffic, to everybody, I didn't want, you know, part of my ego didn't want the cast to think that I was this crazy girl. Right. Uh, it was like when I did Grease, when I, when I did Grease, I was playing the cheerleader. I was anything but a cheerleader. I was a, a beatnik jazz singer <laughs> when I started doing Grease in a lot of ways. Here you are as Patty Simcox, like. I'm playing Patty Simcox <laughs> and the first run through of that, I could barely get the lines out. I had to say things like, you know, hi kids. And, you know, and I had to say words like goodness gracious. Those words never came out of my mouth in Brooklyn in my life. And so when you're kind of embarrassed at first, you're not that confident about what you're doing. And and the first day of rehearsal, and the first day of rehearsal was the first day of shooting. Wow, it's scary. A lot. 
and I and I had just pushed Frank down a flight of stairs, and I had to come in with all these secrets and with all this stuff. And boy, I'll tell you, that first week was very difficult. Um, also, because I felt like Delia was going through a revolving door, this crazy thing that she had done and couldn't, there was no one she was close enough to, to say, you know, I just pushed Frank down a flight of steps. Um, it was so hard. It was, it was like, I thought it was kind of out of my skill set at that point. I, oh, I, I know what I was going to say was I had mascara and everything all over my face because the character was crying and my hair was a mess. And, you know, at first they're trying to clean me up and I went to see the um, creative consultant and I explained to him, I said, could you please tell them to not do that? I, this is what I feel about Delia. If when it goes on the air and it doesn't work, but it worked. Oh, worked really well too. <laughs> Everybody wanted to know what the f is going on with this human being. And because I was convinced that if I stuck to the truth of what I felt her truth was, um, the audience would instinctively feel that and they would relate. You know, I, I think about this, you know, when talking about the rehearsal process, it's changed so much. They, there is very little rehearsal process now with, with soaps. Do you ever think about if you, had been dropped into like general hospital with a different process for your very first like TV job. Would that have been so overwhelming coming from theater? That would have been overwhelming. I mean, this was overwhelming because we had a lot of rehearsal and you, if you had to incrementally get better or you would get really a lot of notes. If, if you slid during the day because we did a, a blocking thing that was kind of for us to take notes then after lunch, we did a first run through. I don't think we did it in costume, but sometimes I would do mine in costume because it helped me. Um, Cause you know, I dress like, um, you know, I dress in like antique clothing and stuff like that. It was not Delia at all. And um, <laughs> so the, the clothing would help me. So we did a first run through, then we did a dress rehearsal. And then we would sit down after the first run through and get notes and notes and notes and notes and then the second rehearsal we would get even more notes and then you're on now that's a lot also for at the time I was 22 that's a lot for a 22 to take a lot of input yeah again. would I find this process more difficult uh at that age yes at this age I go all right the homework has to be done at home I, I didn't really know about doing that homework at home then because I was used to being part of a theater community that we did all our homework kind of in front of each other. But now I know what I know, but I still don't, I don't like it. It's not like, oh, goody, I, I'll do all my scenes and then I'm done for the day. Right. It seems luxurious now to think that you had this process that was more like theater than it, it is now. Because now it's like just theater. It was definitely like doing a play. It was it was like doing a, a one act play. And uh, the scenes were 10 to 12 pages. Wow. There was no filler. And there were no, what I called, well, I have to say that Catherine Hicklin came up with this term drive-bys. <laughs> so I can't take credit for this. There were no, drive-bys like a scene where you go blah 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 cut that's the end of that first scene then the next scene is blah 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 cut you know a little added which is a lot of this filler it's just a setup for some there was no filler it was all important information and there was a lot of blocking and now um, the last time I watched General Hospital, there was like no blocking. People people didn't even enter into the room. It was like, I, I, I'm not, you know, I don't want to criticize because I know that time is of the essence. Right. But I remember this sweeping, even in One Life to Live, we had 
sweeping musical numbers and extensive blocking and huge sets. And I mean, the sets on One Life to Live were incredible. And when I started there in 2001, I have to say, I never had so much fun in my life. I said, I can't believe they're paying me to do this, to do Roxy. I just, um, it was incredible. And, and it was very well thought out and, and very choreographed and very creative and very colorful. You know, since you're talking about One Life to Live, it just makes me think, do you think that it's crazy that that ABC canceled One Life to Live? I do you think that have. they, they never should have. I was going to ask you because it just feels like a huge mistake. Never should have. Have, has, have you ever heard anyone like on the executive side ever admit to that? Well, you know, they fired Brian Franz soon after that. And I think Brian Franz was really responsible for it. And I don't care if he ever hears this either. You know, I don't know what he thought he was reinventing. You know, they've had nothing to replace it in any kind of substantial way. You know, they they, they have ABC News, I guess. And all day. Shows. All day. All day. I don't know if they switched the time to rate from Rachel Ray. To, uh, I, you know, I don't know what they did, but I, I think um, it was not successful. And I think they made a mistake. I think they made a huge mistake. I think the audience feels they made a huge mistake and they, they lost something that, yes, it was expensive for them. Mm -hmm. But see, the world has changed so much. When Ryan's Hope came on the air, there were three networks. And it, it, there was such a huge viewing audience. Like, it was amazing. In two weeks, I was famous. Isn't that unbelievable? I bet walking down the street, everyone knew right away you were on Ryan's Hope. Two weeks. If they didn't know exactly who I was, well, they, a lot of them knew exactly who I was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the same thing with, with One Life to Live. Um, and the same thing with loving, you know, I did loving for a year. I had a great time with that. Also, I, I, I just think that these shows were, were very entertaining to people. And what should be our goal? It, our goal is to entertain. And if we're not doing, if we're not doing that, we're not doing our job. What do you think Roxy is up to today? That's really, you know, something that's really a good, that's really like the best question. <laughs> I want to know, did she get her happy ending with Max? Did she chase him down? <laughs> uh, the marriage to Max was one of the best scenes I think I've ever done. Bar none, our wedding in Vegas was brilliantly written. Our honeymoon that he didn't know he was on a honeymoon was <laughs> during the live week. It was extraordinary. It was absolutely, I said, I can't believe they're paying me to do this. I would pay them to do this, to slither under the covers, wake him up and have him just in a state of complete shock that what was he doing with Roxy? What would, well, you know, because of the pandemic, Roxy might have lost her beauty parlor. You're right. Opening, closing, opening, closing. You know, uh, but let's see, her second occupation was she had that hotel with the with the stuffed animal. Uh, I want to say it was a stuffed beaver, but it wasn't. Uh, stuffed possum or whatever it was, mm -hmm. that, that crazy hotel. So maybe, you know, she still has that. Or maybe she uh, modernized to Airbnb. You got it. There you go. There you <laughs> go. That's what she's doing. She's air being being and everything she can. Uh, I miss her. I have to say, I miss Roxy a lot. I'm not that I don't miss Delia. I do, but um, you know, Roxy was my um, my gift that I was given, and then my gift that I felt like after right after nine eleven that I had the ability to entertain people mm. at such a, a, a delicate time. 
And um, it was such a joy to take on that entertain the troops type of mentality of what I felt, what entertainment is all about. It's to lift people's spirits, make them think about things or make them have fun. And I just felt so, so lucky to be able to do that. You know? I always think actors take a little bit of each character with them when they leave a set for good. What have you taken with you from Delia and what have you taken with you from Roxy? Well, Delia, I know how to cry on cue. Ooh. <laughs> I, you know, I pretty much I can cry if I want to, you know? Yep. Um, Delia, Delia became more fun as, the, as it went on. My last four years of Ryan's Hope was a blast. I had an anti-clothing store. You know, it was so colorful. It was just, I married Roger again. We probably would have gotten divorced again. I mean, I, there was just, there was, I loved working with Claire Levine and Paul Mayer. Got, you know, they may they rest in peace. We talked a lot, uh, Katie and I talked a lot about Claire last night about what a genius Claire Levine was. Now, Claire would not like the fact that Delia is on General Hospital. I don't think, unless she was writing it. If she was writing it, and you know, the writers didn't exact, the writers for Delia on General Hospital were the writers for Roxy. So it was kind of a combination of Roxy and Delia, I have to say, because Delia's background was so complex. It's hard to write unless you really know all that background right. and what triggers her. Um, but I think they did a they did a good job, and I would um, I would temper it because Roxy is even more outlandish than Delia is. But but you know I I felt the show needed color, so I went wherever you know wherever I felt like it needed to go. But that's fun being able to like go for that too. Yes, yeah. yes, um, but. Katie and I talked about so much having to do with Ryan's Hope and, uh, you know, how ex spectacular it was and, and the actors on it and, and um, Helen Gallagher and who's still alive. Bernie Barrow, unfortunately, is not. My dear friend, uh, who is also Kate's you know, she considers Nancy Addison her best friend. I consider Nancy, you know, Addison my sister because we had a, we, we had a different relationship than Kate. We understood each other on a very familial, uh, being Jewish girls from New York City. There was something that we really understood about our, uh, our background. Yeah. And um, it not being a typical uh, working class background, because it wasn't. My father was a hairdresser. My, my life was filled with art. I went to the theater from the time I was a little girl. She had a lot of that sophistication as well. I think her father was a furrier. Um, we, we, we had something that was, we were both tiny. You know, we were tiny petite Jewish girls from the New York area. And so it, it ran very deep, you know, the it was a soul connection like, that you can't it manufacture. Having, it was like having a sister. She, I, you know, she was like my little older sister, but when we looked at each other, we knew certain things and, you know, Kate and her were very, very different, but they they traveled all across Europe together. They did a lot of spectacular things that uh, that Nancy and I never got to do. But I spent the last three years with Nancy when she was sick. Mm. I spent a lot of time with her. So I really, but it was like being with your sister. That's right. And it's a gift to be able to spend that time together too. It's a little gift. And, and when I went back, when I went back to One Life to Live, um, She'd watch me every day and she was so, she was so happy for me. She was, she just was so, so happy for me. So um, it, 
you know, she was so talented and so beautiful and so tragically um, died so young. Yeah, taken from us. Yeah. And, you know, but that's the one thing though. It's like the legacy of Ryan's Hope. I just still feels like it resonates all there's of these years later. There's a book that's coming out and I, I, I had it. I just had a pre-copy of it. Uh, Tom Lasante, L-I-S-A-N-T-I. Do you know Tom? I do know Tom. Oh, good. Well, there is a book coming out. I wrote the foreword. Oh, you for did. The book. Yes, and that's coming out in October. And uh, it's the oral history of Ryan's Hope. And um, a, a lot of people were interviewed for it. Uh, Kate, unfortunately, was doing a lot of traveling and, and couldn't. Um, but uh, there's a lot of stories in there. There's a lot of stories. Oh. And some of them are, are, you know, people had a had displeasure sometimes with the way they were treated there. I didn't. Uh, I, I mean, I did have some things there that were not right. And um, th they didn't have to do with Claire and Paul. They had to do with other factors. Uh, there was a vice president of ABC, Jackie Smith, who was neurotic at best. And... Um, I got let go at one point, but it worked out okay because they had to pay me off and I, I was doing a comedy show at a, at a comedy club for like six months. So it was like, okay, you're giving me money, me money to do comedy, but I never should have been let go. And it was a lot on her instruction. Do you know exactly why? Did you ever yeah, get the why? I do know why actually, but and there, it wasn't like there wasn't a reason. I have, um, I've been on thyroid medication since I'm 18. Mm -hmm. And I was off of my thyroid medication. I was trying to do it through a holistic doctor. So I was off my thyroid medication, which would have been somewhat of a problem. But the worst problem was that, and this is where it gets really crazy. I had these, uh, I had white spots that were um, caused by lack of pigmentation mm -hmm. and a very unscrupulous um, skin doctor who I won't mention his name because he will find me and he will try to sue me. Oh, because don't do that. Tried, he always tried to sue me from a, an article that was written in the post about his, uh, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. So I was on cortisone. Oh. And if you know anything about cortisone, you know it can put on a lot of weight. Yeah. And the combination of being on the cortisone and being not on my thyroid pills created a problem. And I should have taken the bull by the horns and gone back to my regular endocrinologist. And I didn't. I was just hell bent on on doing this thyroid naturally. And it just you can't do it when you when you really system, systemically have a, a problem with thyroid. But the cortisone, I I just blew up. And so she'd say to me, well, you know, you're eating too much, Eileen, Jackie Smith. You're and I go, I'm not even eating. No, like, you don't know what's going on here. You I know, it just to... makes me think because we've come like, so she was anorexic herself, oh. you know, but um cortisone is a very uh i wouldn't say it's a dangerous thing it's a wonder drug for but uh, i will show you you know what it does is on a person i think i'm back to fighting weight but what it does is it creates extra skin in areas around your neck around your shoulders around it it, it bulks you up and um and it's not weight that you can lose so quickly. Yeah, it's not like going to the gym and like, you know, eating a bunch of salads. This is, it's no, very different. I eventually, you know, I did, I did go away for a month. Uh, I went on a leave of absence and I did go to this, what they call the rice clinic down in, in North Carolina. And I, and I got back to fighting weight and they didn't want to put me back on my thyroid. They said, well, see how you do in New York. But you see, under the stress of doing a television show and everything, the thyroid goes- Reacts to that stress. 
And, you know, it's one thing, and, and you know, when you're at the rice clinic, literally you're on 600 calories a day. So I lost every bit of weight that I had gained, um, you know, and at that point I was off of the cortisone. Um, it just, it, it's not a, it's not a normal situation. You're under no stress. You're, I was the thinnest person there. I mean, they hated me there. 600 calories though. That's so, that's nothing. 600 calories. But I was around people that weighed 600 pounds. Oh my goodness. But for you, you must've lost the weight fast on 600. I lost the weight. I lost the weight in like two weeks. Yeah. I lost about 20 pounds, you know, cause it was all like weird weight. And um, I, it just was, it was bizarre. And then I came back after that hiatus and everything was good. And then the weight started creeping back up again, but that I could have put the garbage on that. They just were acting weird. Joe Hardy had taken over as producer. He had um, the character of, um, well, Callie Timmons played Maggie. And he thought Maggie was gonna be like the new Delia, the newer, younger Delia. So he kind of, and, and Joe liked me and I know he liked me, but he did not do right by me. So he called me up one day and he said, and he, he kind of talked like Truman Capote. He's still alive and I, and I like him. He's a talented yeah. man, but I don't like what he did. He said, um, I didn't know you lived on 78th Street. And I went, oh, this is oh, what's coming here. And, and we talked and I knew he had lived on 78th Street with, with someone who had passed away. And he said, mm, we're sending Delia away to San Diego. And I said to him, are you sending her away with two weeks severance or six months? And there was the longest pause and I was like, oh. and he goes, mm, six months. And I went, bye, Joe. And I just hung up the phone. And I was like, okay, all right, okay. But you got and six I, months. I got six months of salary to do a comedy show that I really want to do. Okay, groovy. And almost three years to the day, I get a message on my machine. I was out jogging. And at that point, I have run out of money. I was doing theater. You can't really make a living and, you know, pay your mortgage. And, but I was, I was pretty happy and I was really in, you know, in good shape again. And, and I was jogging in Central Park, but I had a feeling I had a phone call. So I call up like my answering machine. <laughs> it's Joe Hardy again. Hi, Eileen, I hope you're well today. Would you call me immediately? <laughs> and um, I went, okay, they're going to ask me to come back to work. But I'm not calling him today. No, Keep I'm waiting. Not, I'm not calling him today. And this go round, whatever amount of time is left on the show, I'm going to have a good time. And I'm going to do things my way. Uh, my way, which I never really had an artistic problem with anybody. So I was always kind of doing it my way, but I was so in the loop of doing a lot of theater and doing a lot of music that, that I had to let him know that if I needed to be out at four o'clock, I needed to be out at four o'clock, which wasn't really a problem because we were usually out by four, but um, I went in to see him and um you know, and I said, you shouldn't have done what you did. And he went, it wasn't me. It was Jackie Smith. I went, okay. Let her All take right. the I'll let, I'll <laughs> let her choose me as much as, you know, fun. Well, I mean, so I think we could be here all day telling stories and I feel like we need to have you back, especially maybe when Tom's book is out, right? Tell more yes, stories. It's coming, out in it's coming out in October. So I'd love to. Yeah, yeah, I think this would be great. It'd be kind of like a fun companion piece because I know a lot of people are going to get their hands on that book too. Oh, yeah. 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 Also, let me just put a plug in. I am in another book that I wrote chapters for called Tell Me More, Greece, Tell Me More, Tell Me More. 
stories about Greece. So. I love that. I'm a Greece fanatic. Yeah. Broadway show, movie, it doesn't matter. Greece too, love it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if anybody wants to read some, you know, salacious stories. I love behind the scenes stories. I think they're my absolute favorite. So yeah. Well, Kristen, so this, was great. this was so wonderful and so nice to meet you. Thank you.